Welcome to Medicare for All Explained. This podcast will enlighten our listeners and dispel the distortions that surround Medicare for All. Medicare for All Explained is produced in collaboration with Physicians for a National Health Program and is hosted and produced by Joe Sparks. I'm your host, Joe Sparks. This is Episode 74. Highlights from the House Oversight Committee hearing on Medicare for All. The House Oversight and Reform Committee had a hearing, quote, examining pathways to universal health coverage, end quote, and Medicare for All was a large part of that discussion. In this episode, I highlight the testimony of a representative and witnesses who explain why they support Medicare for All. First, we hear from Representative Cori Bush. She is a nurse and represents Missouri's District 1, which includes St. Louis and some suburbs. Representative Bush discusses her firsthand experience with our inadequate health care system. St. Louis, and I thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, for your partnership in convening this historic hearing on the urgent need for comprehensive and universal health coverage in the United States. The committee's exemplary leadership, tireless advocacy, and commitment to genuine health equity will rightfully bring this conversation back to the forefront of public health policy. I must acknowledge the tremendous work and contribution of Senator Sanders and Rep. Jayapal for putting forth the boldest legislative proposal to date, the Medicare for All Act, and to my sisters in service on this committee for their partnership and steadfast leadership in our effort to protect health care as a human right. Thank you to our esteemed witnesses, a comprehensive range of patients and researchers, healthcare professionals who have come together today to passionately advocate for universal health care. Medicare for All is transformational policy change that will implement a national single-payer universal health care system that guarantees comprehensive health care coverage to every person in America and in the for-profit, privatized, broken system we have in place now. I have personally borne witness to the stark inequities faced by uninsured and underinsured patients during my tenure as a registered nurse. For some people, it's hard to imagine rationing expensive medication like insulin, skipping dialysis appointments, foregoing surgical procedures, or refusing medical care entirely. People are having to choose between their life or a lifetime of medical debt, and that's not okay. And I know because I'm one of those people. Until I was sworn in as a member of Congress, I was uninsured for over a week. And actually, I've spent the better part of my adulthood lacking access to health coverage, overburdened by medical debt, and unable to receive regular preventative and routine medical care. It shouldn't have taken a job for me to be able to access affordable medical care. Health care is a human right, and we should guarantee it for everyone. Providing every single person in the United States with health care is a a powerful anti-poverty mechanism. Medicare for all would help low-income households save over $38 billion annually on medical out-of-pocket expenses like deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, and self-payments. Research has proven universal coverage will help reduce poverty rates by over 20%. In St. Louis, our communities are facing systemic threats to their health from all angles, from poverty, substandard housing conditions, environmental destruction, overdose and mental health crises, pollution to over-policing. Lack of affordable health care has resulted in millions of preventable deaths before the pandemic, and the situation continues to rapidly deteriorate as COVID-19 claims over one million lives and counting. While Democrats have a majority in the House, Senate, and the executive branch, it is imperative lawmakers seize this narrow opportunity now to enact transformational public health policy and and poverty reductive policies like Medicare for All. Taking strides towards universal health care coverage is the only path forward to reversing troubling trends in U.S. population health. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to earnestly consider the lethal consequences of continuing to prioritize big pharma profits over human life and health. Thank you, and I yield back. Next up is Nicole Lyons. Ms. Lyons is a patient and disability advocate. She explains how our healthcare system 
caused her to need another transplant. Hi. Okay. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today, uh, members of the House Committee. I'm just give me one second. I'm having a little technical difficulty right now. Okay. So my like as the speaker said, my name is Nikki Lyons. Um, I'm here to speak today because the second time in my 20s, I am waiting for an organ transplant um, due to kidney failure. This loss of control regarding so many aspects of my life and waiting for an organ transplant has had me thinking for many times about what I would say to you, those with the power to make changes in this place where decisions are made. Like so many Americans, Medicare for All would have changed the course of so many aspects of my life and provide comfort for my future. The first time I found out I was sick, I was at a hospital in the middle of college midterms week, and they were waking up for an emergency appendectomy. The diagnosis was not adequately explained, and there is no follow-up care that one would expect. As a struggling college student, I didn't have the luxury to see a doctor anywhere besides the emergency room. Because of this, I didn't know how truly sick I was. And because of my illness, I ended up failing out of school, which further delayed my career and cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Years later, I would have found out at that time, I already should have been looking for a transplant because I was in the end stages of kidney failure, not told just to watch my sodium or not just to watch my sodium as I was told. Had I had regular to access healthcare, blood tests, anything like that, the extent of my organ failure could have been stalled or even prevented had it been caught early enough. While waiting for my first transplant, instead of resting and conserving the little energy I did have, I was working 50 plus hours a week on my feet and at a, at a bar and at a gym to afford my doctor's appointments and medications. For those who don't know, potential transplant patients are evaluated for stability as to not waste the gift of an organ. They look at your housing, your economic status, your compliance with doctors. Not being able to afford medication or appointments could have disqualified me for the organ I needed to live at any point. Medicare for all would have meant not deciding if I need to skip meals to afford qual to qualify for a kidney. I wouldn't have had to work myself to the bone while incredibly sick. I was lucky enough to receive a transplant in 2016 but am again in organ failure. This round of organ failure, I can say with 100% certainty would have been prevented by Medicare for All. I wasn't able to get regular transplant checkups because of the resources I had allotted for healthcare went towards mitigating the symptoms of long-term COVID. Because of the lack of care, I had no idea my body was rejecting my transplant as a complication of said long-term COVID. I haven't been able to properly work or attend class adequately since winter 2020. The COVID symptoms transitioned into kidney failure symptoms so seamlessly to the point I didn't realize what was happening. All I had needed was a simple blood test and the rejection would have been caught earlier. When rejection is caught quickly, it is very treatable. I unfortunately wasn't that lucky. It was amazing I was alive for the second time in my life. Since June, I have had six long-term hospital stays with the longest being seven weeks traveled 12 hours a week, three times a week, 12 hours, three times a week for dialysis for three and a half hours, blood transfusion, chemical similar to chemo to try and save the kidney and prevent anything from getting worse. And that just ends up making me feel significantly worse. I've had days I'm only able to be awake for four hours. There's no way for me to work, finish school or thrive at all in this condition. On top of this, I had no insurance when this first started until Medicare kicked in, which took six months from the time I applied. I was told their online system never got my application several times. And then after that, several times the local office had lost my paperwork and never filed it. So for those six months, I couldn't access care unless I went to an ER. I ended up going into heart failure as well during this time, which took four ERs to catch, but I was had I been able to see a cardiologist for something as simple as an ultrasound of the heart or an echo, it would have been spotted immediately. I was also told peritoneal dialysis would have been a much better option than the standard hemodialysis that I had to endure because no surgeon would place the right catheter if I didn't have insurance to pay for said surgery. 
So I have spent the past six months getting my the entirety of my blood taken out through a tube in my neck, cleaned and returned to my body, while often going into shock when there's a loss of fluid because it makes your heart unable to pump blood through the body, having horrible insomnia, deep pain and fatigue, six months of suffering due to a lack of access to care for a medical situation that should have been prevented in the first place. Medicare eventually kicked in and now 229 days after my first dialysis session, I am finally switched over to in-home peritoneal dialysis that I should have gotten in the first place. 229 days of my life were robbed for me for reasons out of my control, but preventable for the next person by the elected officials sitting in this room. The experience I briefly shared are but a drop in the bucket compared to my full story. I want to take the time to thank everybody for listening to me and I implore you to take the time to fully absorb what the words I said meant. The situation is happening across the country and Medicare for all would prevent it. It is inhumane to present any human being in a situation where they must choose between eviction, a lack of food, or their health care. Thank you. Ms. Lyon's experience illustrates some of the many reasons why the U.S. has the most expensive health care system in the world. Our next section has Ms. Leslie Templeton discussing how our health care system caused her great insecurity. Ms. Templeton is a disabled activist who works on disability, health care, and drug policy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. My name is Leslie Templeton, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I am a 25-year-old disabled person, and some of my diagnoses include epilepsy, kidney disease, ADHD, familial hypercholesterolemia, and depression. Being 25 and sick is extremely funny. Um, While many of my friends are worried about their careers, finding life partners, and what they're doing next week, I have the added worry about what my future holds regarding my health. I wonder if I'll always be able to access my health care and treatments. If heaven forbid something goes wrong and I don't have access to health care, what will happen to me? Sitting before you, I'd be lying if I said there aren't nights I cry about this, scared of it all, of my diseases, of my future, of losing my health care. With Medicare for all, these wouldn't be concerns I would have to live with every day of my life. I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to access life-saving health care I need right now. That is a privilege that has given me the ability to be here today. Before I was able to access treatment, I struggled to do most things or fully participate in life. I don't know if you'll, how, I don't know if you'll understand how deeply I mean this, but having access to health care has allowed me to be a 25-year-old. My Wellbutrin, an antidepressant, has given me the ability to enjoy life. My kidney medication is slowing, if not preventing, further progression of my kidney disease and ensuring I feel well enough to live my life the way I want to. And there's so much more. I am fortunate enough to be able to afford these interventions currently due to my income level, a privilege not everyone has. Being sick is expensive, and that expense can make treatment inaccessible to so many people. Being able to access healthcare is not enough. It's being able to afford it, too. As long as I can always have access to health care and I can afford it, I'll be able to hopefully live a long life. I'll get married. I'll see my kids graduate from college. I'll grow old and watch my body age gracefully. Without Medicare for all, that outcome is not guaranteed, just as it's not guaranteed for millions of Americans right now. What people don't talk about enough is the cost of staying alive. My ability to live is based on whether I can afford it or not. And that thought keeps me up at night. So many people are in a similar situation to me. Just look at GoFundMe. People shouldn't have to rely on charity to stay alive. To put it bluntly, I I don't want to die. I want to live a long life without constant worry of whether I will be able to afford my meds each month or I'll have insurance to cover my doctor's visits. Medicare for all would give every American that peace of mind, especially those who rely on the healthcare system the most in order to stay alive. No one should go broke because they have life-threatening illness. No mother should have to choose between getting her medication or her kids. 
No child should have to watch their parents suffer through pain and ailments because they are not insured. We Americans are counting on you to change this reality for us. Because, again, to put it bluntly, we don't want to die. Thank you. Next, Dr. Uche Blackstock delves into the bias and racism in our healthcare system. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, Representatives Bush, Presley, Talib, Ocasio-Cortez, and all of the members of the House Oversight Committee here today. It's an honor to be inv invited to testify during this very important hearing, a key step toward addressing racial health inequities in our country. I'm Dr. Uche Blackstock, an emergency medicine physician with over 17 years of clinical experience, a second generation black woman physician who has lived experience with injustice and the founder of an organization dedicated to advancing health equity. I have worked for years in communities where far too many of my patients were either uninsured or underinsured, mostly black and brown Americans who have sadly been disregarded by our country. They are not only dealing with mental and physical health issues, but also with systemic afflictions like bias and racism, housing insecurity, economic instability, and lack of access to reliable transportation. These are what we call the social determinants of health, the factors which influence the health and health outcomes of communities and people. Lack of access to health care is one of the primary social determinants of health. I've taken care of thousands of patients over the years, many I can never forget. The 40-year-old Black man with a history of high blood pressure who came into my ER unconscious on a stretcher after he collapsed at home in front of his family. The paramedics were performing CPR on him. The CAT scan of his head showed a brain bleed, a complication of untreated high blood pressure. He had been unable to afford to pay out of pocket for his blood pressure medication since he lost a job a year prior and as a result, his health insurance. The 55-year-old Latina woman who came into my ER complaining of bleeding and swelling from her left breast for several months. She explained that she did not have health insurance and did not have a primary care physician. After we spoke, I examined her and found a foul-smelling mass protruding from her left breast. It was advanced breast cancer. As Black people and people of color, just living in this country is an act of survival, let alone being able to access quality and culturally responsive health care. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the country's presumed reckoning with racism has only exposed the deep pre-existing fissures in our healthcare and public health system. Despite advances in healthcare innovation and technology over the last 75 years, Black men still have the shortest life expectancy. Black women have the highest maternal mortality rates and Black babies have the highest infant mortality rate. Overall, Black Americans have a six-year life expectancy gap compared to white Americans the widest gap since 1998 and widened even more by the pandemic. This pandemic should have been a wake up call to help us understand the urgency of identifying a path toward making universal healthcare a, 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 a reality among other critical strategies to improve health equity. I have had a front row seat to the tragic loss of black and brown life from COVID-19 and racism. During the height of the pandemic in New York City, I noticed my patients' demographics quickly shifted from a racially and socioeconomically diverse patient population to mostly black and brown patients. They were essential workers, service workers. Some had underlying medical problems. Others were left with no choice but to use public transportation and many lived in crowded multi-generational housing. I vividly remember an elderly black man who came into my urgent care with shortness of breath and fever. He was in a wheelchair and his oxygen level was shockingly low. He lived alone. I was very worried that he had COVID pneumonia and asked if I could call an ambulance to bring him from urgent care to the closest ER. He refused. He didn't wanna die in the ER, he told me. He didn't think he would receive good care because he didn't have health insurance. He felt safer at home. For many years, I worked in two ERs in New York City, Bellevue Hospital, the oldest public hospital in the country, and Tisch Hospital, a private institution that is part of NYU Lincoln Medical Center among the wealthiest hospitals in the country that has gotten hundreds of millions of dollars richer after federal bailouts. At these two ERs that literally sit next door to each other, I experienced firsthand deep inequities in our healthcare system, one that is separate and unequal. Patients were divided up based on insurance and race. 
Nationally, at private academic medical centers, Black patients are two to three times less likely than white patients to receive care, while uninsured patients overall are five times less likely than patients with insurance coverage to be treated. In cities across this country, the top-ranked hospitals do not treat as many patients of color as white patients, even when they are located in diverse communities. This is the definition of systemic racism. People who look like me are living this every day, but it should not fall solely on us to always have to call out when something is wrong. Now is the time to protect our most vulnerable and underserved communities and identify a pathway to ensuring universal healthcare for all Americans. We must work to break the cycles of trauma and injustice to foster generational progress for more people, especially people of color, because it is cruel to talk about an American dream if only a select few live to see it. Thank you. The last voice we shall hear from is Addie Barkin. Mr. Barkin founded the Be a Hero Fund. According to the Be a Hero website, it is currently, quote, focus on expanding access to home and community-based services, end quote. Mr. Barkin has ALS and is almost completely paralyzed. He cannot speak and must write his words and then use a computer-generated voice to speak. Good morning, Chairwoman Maloney, Representative Bush, and members of the committee. Thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify. My name is Audie Barkin, and I am the co-executive director of Be a Hero, an organization whose mission is to win health justice in America. As you can see, I am currently in bed. I live in California, and it is rather early here. And because I am living with the neurological disease ALS, which has left me almost completely paralyzed, it takes me a very long time to get ready in the morning. So, I am grateful for your grace in permitting me to participate from bed. But I am even more grateful that it is my bed, in my bedroom, in the home I share with my wife and our two young children. I am able to live at home because I have 24-hour home care. Without it, I would be forced to live in a nursing home, separated from the people I love. I don't know if that would be a quality of life that I would be willing to tolerate. Home care is literally keeping me alive. Three years ago, I came to the Capitol to testify in the Rules Committee at the first ever hearing about Medicare for All. I was emaciated, weighing about 100 pounds, down from 160. I had trouble breathing and was sweating even though the room was cold. Every month, my body deteriorated further. I felt like I was dying. Later that year, I had to decide whether to get a tracheostomy, a procedure to implant a breathing tube into my windpipe, to compensate for my failing diaphragm. But I didn't know how I would be able to pay for the care that would allow me to stay alive. My insurance had already denied me a ventilator, stating that it was experimental, and then two weeks after that, they rejected access to an FDA-approved ALS drug. Even good health insurance, which I have, does not cover the long-term home care I need to survive. Paying out of pocket would have left my family bankrupt quickly. And so for too long after my diagnosis, my wife, Rachel, and I tried to get by without home care, which put the burden on her to care for both my young son and me. We eventually secured 24-hour home care after suing my health insurance company in federal court. Home care has been life-changing, allowing me to participate in my family's life in ways I thought were no longer possible for me. My daughter Willow was born six months after I gave my testimony, and now I'm a father to two beautiful, wild children. But it shouldn't take a seasoned activist, a team of lawyers, and the generosity of strangers and friends to get the health care you need to survive. The reliance on crowdfunding to afford health care is a uniquely American tragedy. My outcome is the exception, but the challenges we face, fighting insurance companies for services we are rightfully owed, are not. We spend such absurd amounts on health care, and we get such bad outcomes for our money. The high costs of care and infuriating bureaucracy burdens all of us, including nurses and doctors, working families, and small businesses. The only people who benefit from this absurd system are the corporate executives who profit off of our pain, 
and spend inordinate amounts of money trying to stop you from making life much better for your constituents. We've allowed greedy healthcare corporations to set the parameters of what we can expect of our healthcare system, and because of it, we've been forced to normalize the fate of bankruptcy, illness, and death. It's shameful that in the richest country in the world, we choose to inflict so much suffering. Since that first hearing about Medicare for all, our country has been through the worst public health crisis in a century. The pandemic has revealed and exacerbated the existing inequalities in our profit-driven health care system. It has hit hardest on disabled people, poor people, Black, Latino, and Indigenous people, and especially people who live at the intersections of these categories. And one out of three COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. are related to gaps in health insurance. Nearly a million Americans have already died from the coronavirus. How much more is necessary to shock our legislators into action? When we lost 3,000 lives on September 11, we responded by reorganizing our national security system, launching a global war on terror, and conducting two massive invasions and occupations. 300 times more people have died in this pandemic, but we have not marshaled our national energy to build a better health care system. It is a scandal and it is a shame. But in the last two years, we've also seen glimmers of what's possible when our government takes action to prioritize people over profits and works to guarantee care for all. Congress subsidized the Affordable Care Act marketplace plans, leading to unprecedented enrollment, and paid states to keep millions more people on Medicaid. As a result, more Americans have health insurance than ever before. Taxpayers funded vaccine research, and then, our government made vaccines easily accessible to all at no cost. And recently, our government made rapid test kits available to all Americans who requested them, free of charge. These programs and many others are at risk of ending if Congress does not fund them and when the pandemic emergency policies expire. Instead of returning to the status quo, which fails all of us and especially our most vulnerable communities, we should build on the progress we have made during the pandemic. The American people deserve so much more, and so much better. Our seniors and disabled children and adults deserve to live at home, not be warehoused in institutions. Working people deserve high-quality care regardless of their income or their employer marital status. The people of rural America deserve good mental health care options, good community clinics, good accessible hospitals. And so do the residents of poor urban America and the people who live on Indian reservations. And seniors on Medicare deserve care also for the parts of their body above their necks, which means their teeth and eyes and ears and minds. We can and must do better. We know what the solution is. A system that brings everyone in and abandons no one. Where we are patients and people, not opportunities for profit. The road to reach the better world of our imagination may be long, and there are many obstacles in our way. But our North Star is clear. It is time for America to guarantee comprehensive, affordable health care to all. The best way to do that is by enacting Medicare for all. If each one of us continues to demand better, if together we build an even more powerful movement for health justice, then I know that someday we will get there. Thank you. The people you have heard today spoke powerfully about the need for Medicare for All. We should honor their voices by enacting Medicare for All as soon as possible. Thank you for listening. You have been listening to Medicare for All Explained. Remember to tell your family, friends, and colleagues about this podcast. Information about Medicare for All Explained can be found at our website, medicareforallexplained.org. The music for this show is Super Bubbly by Jesse Spillane. The logo was created by Lily Sparks. Thank you for listening.